Okay, everybody, wrap up your conversations. Let's get started. So first of all, I want to say congratulations to all of you who made it. Um, it was very cold up there. And if I say it's cold, that means it's cold. Those of you who were in my 104 class will know I wore shorts well into December. Um, so if I say it's cold, it's cold. Um, so back in, uh, I'm from BC originally, uh, and I've always loved running in bare feet. That's one thing I love doing. Uh, a few times I've run in the bare feet uh, in the snow back in BC, and one time my mom got a call from a concerned friend of hers who basically asked if I was insane and needed to be put away. So again, if I say it's cold, that means it's cold. Um, okay, uh, one other, or a few other pieces of housekeeping. Um, I have finished preparing for uh, the lectures on chapter 9, and I've added a few more key terms. Uh, nothing from chapter 2, but uh, what's on E-class now should be the final list for chapter 9. I tend to add a few as I practice lecturing, uh, because you know, I, I discover some things that, uh, that should be added. Um, additionally, uh, a few people asked questions at the end of last class that I'll answer for everyone. Um, last class I said that I can't guarantee that I will cover everything in lecture that will be on the test. There may be a few things that are only in the book. Uh, someone asked if there was anything in lecture that won't be in the book that's testable, and there I can say definitely there will be. There are a few key terms uh, that I have added that are not in the book that you can only get uh, from lecture, so just wanted to answer that for everyone. Additionally, someone asked about the distinction between sociology and psychology, uh, so many of you are also taking sociology courses. Uh, and I want to be very clear, I'm not saying one is bad or inferior, it's just a different level of analysis. It's obviously a perfectly legitimate scientific enterprise to study how humans behave at a societal or group level, um, I'm not saying one is better. Uh, additionally, the line is fuzzy, right? To a first approximation, the difference is that psychologists study human behavior at the individual level of analysis, while sociologists study it at the group level of analysis. Um, but in the middle, particularly in an area like social psychology, the line is a little bit fuzzy. In fact, at this institution, social psychology is both a sociology and a psychology course. So the line is uh, somewhat fuzzy. Uh, additionally, I, I wrote this in the syllabus, and I forgot to mention it. I, I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but I'll just say this up front. Uh, the number of people on Earth who I agree with on 100% of issues is zero. Uh, there's no one I agree with 100%. So showing a video clip of someone is not saying I agree with every single thing this person has ever said. So, just wanted to say that uh, up front. Um, okay, so now that you've all presumably had a chance to look at E-class uh, and the syllabus, any last questions about uh, the format of the course, what it will look like, or anything like that? Good, okay. So, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, someone walked up and told me how to make the uh, screens go up and down. It was these buttons here with up and down on them. Uh, it's moments like this where I wonder how I got into a PhD program. <laughs> That's a running joke in my family now. Uh, so. Uh, so we finished off just before survey research. Um, so I'm going to say some things about that. So presumably you all know what a survey is. It's a questionnaire given to a sample of people. Uh, but there are some technical terms you have to know. Uh, one is population. And population here doesn't necessarily mean population of a country. Uh, it could, if that's what you're interested in, but the population is the group from which you take a sample. It's the group from which you take a sample. So uh, if you're interested in how uh, Canadian 
beings think, then uh, Canadians would be your population. If you're interested in how human beings think, human beings could be uh, your, uh, your, your, your population. So let, let's say it's Canadians, just for the sake, sake of argument. So we're interested in how Canadians think and behave in some way. So then we will take uh, a sample, because it's too hard to ask every single person in Canada you know, how happy they are, how extroverted they are, or whatever. So we'll get a uh, sample. And uh, the key feature that we want a sample to have is we want the sample to be representative. We want a representative sample. Representative means that the sample is similar to the population in terms of demographics. similar to the population in terms of demographics. So if the population is 50% male, the sample should be 50% male. If the uh, population is 10% senior, so say over the age of 65, then the, the sample should be roughly that as well. Uh, in some of the later chapters, we'll be seeing that some early studies in psychology did not have this feature. Um, for example, there was an early study on moral development that was on all males, um, which of course would not be representative. There are different ways of achieving representative, uh, a representative sample. One is random sampling, which just means Everyone in the population has an equal chance of getting in the sample. So you get a phone book, you have a random number generator, you randomly pick names from the phone book. If you do that, your sample will probably be roughly representative, right? Especially if it's a large sample and you use a uh, random sample. Note, random sampling is different from uh, random assignment, which we'll be saying more about later when we review experiments. Random sampling is where uh, you are choosing people to be in your study. Uh, you randomly pick people to be in the study. Random assignment means you already have your sample and you're randomly putting them into two groups. Or it could be more, but two is Make sure you don't confuse those. If you want to be really fancy, uh, you can do stratified random sampling. Excuse me. Um, which is where you force the sample to be representative. So uh, you can set the study up such that, uh, let's say you want 1,000 people in your study. Uh, so once you hit 500 males, no more males. Once you hit X number of people between the ages of 65 and, uh, and up, uh, no more people in that group. So you can actually set it up in advance so that uh, you have a representative sample at the end. It takes a bit more work to do that, but that's a, a fancier option. Okay. Now, uh, we have to talk a bit about statistics. So, in this section on surveys, uh, it makes reference to a few statistical terms um, and makes reference to an appendix at the back which covers them. You do not have to read the appendix. Uh, you can if you want to review. Uh, it contains more, I think, than we need for an introductory course. So I'm gonna say, focus on the terms I talk about in class. So this, if, if, a, if I mention a statistical term right now, uh, or it's in the key terms, you should know that, but you don't have to read the appendix. Uh, before I raise this, any questions on populations or sampling? Okay, so most of you have taken 104, so uh, this will probably be review. Um, there are three measures of central tendency that you should know. Uh, mean, the median, 
and the mode. The mean is the same as the average, so you take all the scores, add them together, and divide it by the number of scores. Right? Same as the average, they learned back in grade whatever, seven. Uh, the median is the middle score, so you rank order them from smallest to largest. Whatever one is in the middle, that's the median. And if it's an even number of scores, then you take the two in the middle and average them together. And lastly, the mode is the most commonly occurring score. Whichever score occurs the most number of times. There's a, so the mean is, is the most commonly used, but one weakness of using the mean is it is sensitive to outliers or extreme values. If there's a few people who have a really high score or a really low score, they can drag the mean uh, up or down to the point where it's not really representing where most people are. So in cases like that, we would probably use the median. So those are two measures, uh, or three measures of central tendency, but there's another way that uh, distributions can be different, which is variability. How spread out are the scores? Uh, so one example that we'll talk about in chapter 10, there is some evidence that in the case of IQ, uh, the distributions for men and women are different, even though the average is the same. The evidence tends to suggest that when you use a frequency distribution, it looks something like this. Uh, maybe not quite that extreme. I'm not very good at drawing. Um, but the uh, distribution for men is wider. Meaning, uh, there are more men in the extremes. More men who are very low IQ and very high IQ. Even though the average IQ for men and women is 100. So the central tendency is the same, but the degree of variability is different. There are two ways of measuring uh, variability that you need to know. Uh, just range and standard deviation. You'll learn some other stuff later, but I think that's good enough for, for this course. Uh, the range is the difference between the smallest score and the largest score. One's pretty easy to calculate. Uh, the standard deviation, I'll actually do something different than I, that I didn't do in 104. I'll actually show you guys how to calculate the standard deviation. Uh, you won't have to memorize it, but it'll help you see how it's done. But that's more of a teaser for future classes. All you need to know for the test is the standard deviation is roughly how far away, on average, are scores from the mean. So some scores are really far from the mean, some are very close to the mean. Okay, well, how far away on average are they? So for example, in the case of IQ, uh, the standard deviation is about 50. That's approximately how far away on average people are from the average IQ, which is about 100. Now, as a little teaser for future classes, um, I'll actually show us uh, how to calculate uh, standard deviation. <coughs> so let's say there are a set of classes here, a set of students here, that, and these are their grades. So they range from 51 to 99. Now, here's what we'll do. We first calculate the average. So, all these together, oh, not that. So that's the average uh, grade in this class. Should I say, does this go down on its own if I just push it? That is a little distracting. I don't think We take each score and we subtract the mean. Okay, so this one is 29 points below the mean. Uh, which meant, right, that, you, can, you can see that. 
And then we do the same for each of them. So this is their deviation. This is how far away each score is from the mean. And I can't drag it down because then it goes out of whack. Okay. So there we have how far away each score is from the mean. And there's obviously a range. Some are very far from the mean, and some are very close. Now you might think, well, why don't we just add them all together? Well, let's try that. Let's try summing these together. Okay, let's do average. Average, zero. And when you think about it, that has to be true, right? Because they just cancel out. How far away on average are they from the mean? Well, they are the mean, right? That's how far away on average they, they are. So here's what we're gonna do. We want them all to be positive, right? Because then we can do something with them. So what we're gonna do is we're going to square all of them, times them each by themselves. Because when you times a negative by a negative, you get a positive. So we'll just take each of these, raise them to the power of two, Then we get these, and now we'll just get the average of those. So average all of those together. Okay, well that looks pretty preposterous, right? 205, that's too big. Um, so that's the average squared distance from the mean, which by the way, you don't need to know this term, but that's called the variance. We'll learn that later in statistics. Um, you won't be tested on that. But uh, that's too big because we squared them. So we made them positive, but we made them too big. So the last step is we take this number and we square root it to get it back to like a reasonable size that's more represented. So 14, that is the standard deviation. Which makes sense, right? You look at the range, so look, one is 30 away, one's 18 away, some are pretty close. You know, so 14 in this case is the standard deviation. It's how far away, on average, scores are from the mean. So that's just a little teaser for your future classes. You will not be tested on how to do that. Um, I'm just helping you out uh, for your later classes. Okay. Any questions on central tendency or uh, variability? So next, we will talk about correlations. Okay. Everyone get out a piece of paper, or uh, do it on your computer if you want. Uh, people from my 104 class will know this. Write down two numbers. One, how many sports you have played outside of PE class uh, since, uh, let's say, grade eight. So, and, uh, and sports like martial arts or fencing, you know, any physical activity like that that you were not a part of playing, uh, count that. And it doesn't really matter how accurate it is, it's just for the purpose of illustration, and you won't be showing it to me. The other number is how extroverted you are. How extroverted at least you think you are. On a scale of, let's say, one to 10. 10 being the most extroverted. So that's just to get you thinking. 
about how this would work. So let's suppose I um, did this more seriously, got like a representative sample and gave them uh, those two questions. I could construct something that statisticians call a scatter plot. A scatter plot is a, a representation where we uh, place people based on their location in two uh, dimensional space, two variables. So uh, I put sports from 1 to 15, extroversion 1 to 10. So let's say like Bob um, played a lot of sports, so he played like 14 sports, but he's only like average in terms of extroversion. So he's like, I don't know, I guess six, a little, little above average. <coughs> and then, you know, uh, there's Jimmy over here who played uh, uh, one sport, and he's like a two out of 10 uh, in extroversion. And then I just put a bunch of these. Right. Let's say it looks something like this. This would be an example of a positive correlation. Positive correlation meaning as one variable goes up, the other tends to go up as well. If the direction was the other way, which would be kind of surprising, but um, if people who played more sports were more extroverted or uh, less extroverted, really shy and really athletic for some reason, uh, that would mean there's a negative correlation. As one variable goes up, the other tends to go down. Uh, you can quantify a correlation, at least a linear one, using um, the Pearson's correlation coefficient. You don't need to know that term, but um, the way that it's standardly quantified is between minus one and one. Zero would be, uh, actually I'll start with minus, uh, so minus one would be something like this. So that means that they are perfectly negatively correlated. If you know what someone's score is on this, you can perfectly predict what their score is on the other variable. You will never see this. We never see correlations of minus one or one. In psychology, frankly, we're pretty happy if we get 0 0.4. We're like, wow, 0 0.4, that's amazing. Because uh, there's always so much going on with humans, of course. Um, if it was a, so this might be like, or this would be like uh, minus one. Minus 0 0.9 uh, might be something like this. So pretty strong, but there's still a bit of randomness kind of around the, uh, the line of regression. Something like minus, let's make it a bit weaker, maybe 0 0.4, and this is not exact, of course, I'm just you know, roughly like this. You know, yeah, there's a general trend, but now there's kind of more, more randomness. And then 0 uh, is flat and you know, all over the place. So there's no pattern. If you know how high someone is on this, you have no information about what they are up here. Right? So like, I don't know, the correlation between, you know, like I said last time, your pinky toe length and your grades, probably zero. Right? Probably no relationship there. I don't know, maybe. I've never done a study, but I would bet something like that. And then the same would be true uh, for positive relationships. So a correlation of positive one would mean it's all the people are perfectly on the line. There's a perfect relationship between the two, so if you know their score on this, you can perfectly predict their score on the other. And so, right, this would be like, this would be positive one, this might be positive 0 0.9. Any questions about uh, quantifying a correlation? You should be able to tell two things. You should be able to look at a scatter plot uh, hint, hint, uh, and tell whether it's positive or negative, and how strong it is. The further away from zero, the stronger. Uh, and whereas negative or positive has to do with the direction of the correlation. Now let's go back to our uh, sports example over here.
And let's make it positive. That's easier to talk about. So, and that it would almost certainly not be that strong. That's a that's a pretty strong uh, positive correlation, but let's suppose. It would be very tempting, especially for those of you who have not taken 104, uh, to look at that and conclude, ah, playing sports causes you to be more extroverted. But as those of you who have taken 104 or other science classes should know, that is a mistake. In my opinion, this is the single most important thing that you can learn from a psychology class. Correlation does not imply causation. It's the single most important thing that you can learn. Despite this, it is also the thing that people uh, most quickly forget when they go on to write like science articles, like popular science articles. Um, so why is it the case that we can't jump to the conclusion that playing sports causes extroversion? The reason is, whenever you have a correlation like this, there are three possibilities. Uh, possibility one is that A causes B. So in this case, playing sports causes extroversion. That is one of the possibilities, right? It, 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 that would explain why you have this relationship. It's not a crazy idea. It's just not the only possibility. The other possibility is that B causes A. It could be that being extroverted makes you play more sports, right? People who are more extroverted are like, hey, I wanna play sports, I wanna be with people. Um, you know, that's perfectly plausible. And the third possibility is that C, some unknown variable that you haven't measured, or it could be set of variables, causes A and B. Um, you know, maybe rich people play more sports, uh, because they have more money, their parents can afford it, and they're more extroverted. They're more full of themselves, and they go out and talk to people more. I just made that up. I have no idea if that's true, but the point is we don't know. We don't know from this uh, which of these three possibilities is true. Uh, and the wealth one is just an example. C could be anything. It could be anything you didn't measure that could be driving both uh, of the variables that you did measure. <laughs> As we will see later, uh, the way that we do find out about uh, cause and effect is by doing experiments. You get a sample, like we saw earlier. You randomly assign them to two conditions. You do something to one of them that you don't do to the other. You get a group of kids, randomly assign them to two groups, make one of them play sports for six months or something, make the other groups take a break, the other group take a break from sports, and then you measure their extroversion at the end. If the sports group uh, plays more sports, now you have uh, much better evidence uh, that sports exerts a causal influence on extroversion, but a correlational study is not a sufficient basis for inferring causation. Before I say more about correlations, though, any questions about these three? These three are very important. No. So why do we use correlations? Uh, I'll just say briefly that the main value that the book talks about that correlational studies have is they are a basis for prediction. Right? If you find that two variables are correlated, you can use that information to make predictions. The example the book gives is, is a standard one. Uh, if I know your high school GPA, I can predict your college GPA to some degree. There's gonna be some positive correlation there. Not 100%, some of you may have done badly in high school but do better in college and vice versa. Uh, but there will be a, a general uh, you know, trend wherein people who had higher high school GPAs tend to get higher uh, college GPAs. And therefore you can use that kind of information to make uh, predictions. As I say though, the, the secret weapon of a um, uh, psychologist is uh, experiments. 
So in the uh, sports case, so I randomly, uh, I get a group, and I randomly assign them to two groups. I make one of them play, let's say I make one of them play five sports, and the other group play one sport. And then I measure their uh, extroversion. So how many sports they play is the independent variable, or IV, and their extroversion that we measure at the end is the, independent, or the, the dependent variable, or the DV. The way to remember that is your hypothesis is that the independent variable causes a change in the dependent variable, which means that the dependent variable depends on the independent variable, right? If there's a cause and effect relationship, the effect depends on the cause. That's, that's what it means to be an effect. So you think the IV causes a change in the DV, so the DV depends on the IV. That's the way to remember it. So the independent variable is the one that you manipulate, in this case, number of sports played, and the dependent variable is the one you measure, in this case, Uh, to reinforce this point, um, I'm going to show a video from Crash Course Psychology of Hank Green describing how experiments work. This reminds me that I missed something, probably the uh, most important feature of an experiment. I mentioned it earlier, uh, and that's random assignment. Now, I mentioned it in passing, but I didn't emphasize it as much as I would like. So in the video, he said that the point of an experiment is to uh, hold all variables constant and then manipulate one thing, like the independent variable. The way that we hold all other variables constant is random assignment. The point of random assignment is to make sure that these two groups are the same at the beginning, at least roughly the same. There should be roughly the same number of rich people, tall people, happy people, whatever, um, in each group at the beginning. That's the point of doing random assignments, to hold everything else constant and then just change one thing. Very important. That is what distinguishes an experiment from a non-experiment in psychology. Did you randomly assign people to two conditions or more and then manipulate something? Now, the experiments we've been discussing so far uh, are what are called between groups experiments, or between subjects experiments. Uh, because you are randomly assigning people uh, to two groups and comparing the difference between them. Yes? Uh, just one thing regarding the small diagram that you wrote, uh, wrote there. There's only two groups, but shouldn't there technically be three if you want to also have a control group? Um, so this is uh, perfectly fine as an experiment, but yes, uh, it, you can have three, you can have four, you can have five. Um, and so, so I, I'm glad you mentioned those. So you mentioned in the video the control group and the experimental group. Um, but in an experiment, you can also just vary the degree to which you uh, give someone uh, a, a level of the independent variable. So if you, you could call the group that did one sport a control group, but typically the control group is one that gets none of the independent variable, so like you know, zero sports or zero caffeine. Um, but yeah, the, you don't have to do two, it could be three, it could be four, it doesn't really matter. As long as there's random assignment and manipulation of a variable, uh, you have yourself an experiment. Uh, good question. So uh, anyways, but with, between subjects, you are randomly assigning people to two conditions or more, and then you're comparing the difference between them. Right? You're looking at how these two groups are different at the end of the experiment. But you don't have to do things that way. You can also do a within-subjects experiment. Now I'll just note, if 
if I talk about an experiment on the test, or even in general if you see it in a, in a book, you should probably assume it's a between subject. That's probably the more common way of doing things, at least in my experience. Uh, but you can also do a within subject experiment. Uh, and we will do one uh, right now. I apologize to those of you who are in my 104 class, because the same example, I am too lazy to write new word pairs. Um, but here's what we're going to do. I'm, we're gonna do a within subjects experiment now. So I'm going to say uh, a set of word pairs. And for the first condition, I want you all to say the word pairs in your head silently. So just using kind of an auditory image in your head, just say the two words. Um, so if I said jar hammer, just say jar hammer in your head. Now that's not one of them, but that's an example. Okay, so now we'll start. Zebra, jeans. Banana, moon. Chocolate, textbook. Toe, ketchup. Insect, scientist. Thermometer, knife. Box, chair. Can, pepper. All right, now on a computer or a piece of paper, I am going to say the first of each of the word pairs and write down uh, the next one you can have. So you can write down like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think there's eight, uh, and then write down the second word for all the ones that you can remember. Number one, zebra. Two, banana. Chocolate. Toe. Insect, thermometer, box, and can. Okay? So this is about 10% of your grade, so now we'll mark them. <laughs> okay, so um, number one is, uh, is uh, jeans, then moon, Textbook, catch up, scientist, knife, chair, and pepper. So tally it up and uh, write down your total out of eight. Okay, that's condition one. Condition two, same thing, but with one uh, difference. The independent variable that we're manipulating is memorization strategy. This time, don't say them, visualize them. Put the two things together. So if it was jar hammer, form a mental image of a jar with a hammer in it, or some way of putting them together. Okay? So again, there will be eight word pairs. Dog dress. Apple toilet. Cow shoe. Boat, tree, table, baby, house, backpack, fridge, coat, microwave, grave. Okay, so as before, we'll uh, write them down. So. Um, number one, dog. See if you can remember the second word. Number two, apple. Three, cow. Four, boat. 
by table, six backpack. Seven uh, fridge, eight microwave. Okay, now we'll mark them. This is another 10%. Uh, number one, uh, the right answer was dress. Number two, toilet. Three, shoe. Four, tree. Five, baby. Uh, six was house. I accidentally said the second word, but uh, if you got that, that's, that still counts. Uh, seven, fridge. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, wow. Uh, seven, it's, I, I blame the cold. Seven, coat. Eight, uh, great. Okay, mark them uh, and tally them up. And once you tally up the ones for the second one, check which one you did better on. Did you do better on the second one or the first one? Show of hands, who got exactly the same on both? Who did better on the first one? Who did better on the second one? Excellent. Okay, so uh, I've done this with many AP Psych classes. It's the same every time. Consistently, more people do better on the second one. Now, as people in 104 will know, and as many of you could probably figure out, there's a big problem with the way I did this study. Someone who wasn't in my 104 class, can someone tell me what a problem is with the way I did this? Uh, you don't know if they're actually gonna do it correctly. So, you know, sometimes someone might try to get a better, like, I guess, answer, just by kind of repeating what's best for them instead of actually. That could be an issue. It's not, it's not the one I'm looking for. Um, I see a hand back there. That's true, that is definitely a problem, but pretend the, I kicked all the 104 people out. Yes. Yes, these are all problems, but let me put it this way. There's one problem that's specifically a problem for inferring that visualization is better. Oh, because you're going to like spectrum? Yes, exactly. Um, so it could be that you all did better, or not all, that most of you did better the second time because visualization is better, or it could be because you're now more practiced. You've already done this once. So I didn't control for order effects. The way that you control for order effects in a within-subjects experiment is counterbalancing. So you make sure that the order is randomized. Some people do visualization first, some people do uh, auditory uh, first. But other than that, this would be a good example of a within-subjects experiment. Because there's not two groups. There's no control group. In a way, you guys are your own control group. Right? You both are exposed to both levels of the independent variable. So that's a within subject experiment. Okay, one final type of experiment that we have to talk about uh, is one in which you manipulate multiple independent variables. So in the examples I've given so far, uh, I've only manipulated one independent variable, but you can manipulate more than one at a time if you want to. So, uh, here's an example. Suppose I uh, think that caffeine affects your mood. But the effect that caffeine has on mood depends on the temperature in the room. Those two variables interact with each other. So if you uh, drink coffee when you're in a cold room, it makes you happier. Because you're like, okay, I feel warmer and have more energy to get through the cold. But if you drink it in a uh, uh, hot room, you're less happy because you're too agitated from the heat. That could be true, I just made that up. I have no idea if that's true or not, but um, it could be the case. So how would I test for that? Well, I'd have to manipulate two independent variables at the same time. I'd have to manipulate both uh, caffeine and room temperature. So caffeine.
graphene, low versus high. So like low, I give them decaf, and high, I give them uh, coffee with uh, a lot of caffeine. And then uh, room uh, temperature, low and hot. So my hypothesis, if it's a cold room, caffeine will make you happier. So in this condition, people are sad, and in this condition, people are happy. That would be support for my hypothesis, at least uh, the first part of it. And then I think in the hot room, uh, people, uh, uh, people who drink a lot of caffeine will be sad, because they're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so agitated by, by this state. So they're, they're less happy, and then they'll be happier here. This is kind of a toy example. You really have to have statistics in here, like numbers to do it, but this is just to give you a sense of how it works. Um, this outcome would be an example of an interaction effect. An interaction means that the effect of one independent variable depends on the other independent variable. So in this case, um, if you ask, what's the effect of caffeine on mood? The answer is, it depends. What room is the person in? Are they in a cold room or a hot room? If they're in a cold room, the caffeine makes them happier. If they're in a hot room, the caffeine makes them less happy. So that's an example of an interaction. Any questions on this or uh, the between subjects and within subjects? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, we will talk about different threats to validity. Now, psychologists are not very good at naming things. So we talked last class about validity of measurement which is about, uh, is the test uh, measuring what it's supposed to measure? So is the extraver extroversion scale really measuring extroversion? Is the IQ test really measuring intelligence or what have you? But validity in this context is about, uh, did you do your experiment properly? I forget what I call it in the key terms, like validity of uh, experimental design or something like that. Uh, you don't need to know that this part, um, but this is what unites these other two types of validity and what makes them different from uh, measurement validity. So the two types in these terms you do need to know are internal validity and external validity. Both of these are about whether you did your experiment properly. Uh, they're not about measurement like the other sense of validity is. So uh, internal validity is about within your study, how confident can you be that the independent variable caused a change in the dependent variable? Again, internal because it's within your study. Within, within your 100 people or whatever, you did something, you manipulated a variable and you measured another variable at the end. Okay, how confident can you be that your manipulation actually made a difference? So here's an example I uh, gave my 104 class. I want to test out a new teaching method. And let's say I'm teaching two different AP psychology classes. I'm teaching one in Edmonton and one in Vancouver. So uh, this is only about internal. So I have my uh, Edmonton kids and my 
my Vancouver kids. And I use teaching method A with the Edmonton kids and teaching method B with the Vancouver kids. That would be the independent variable. And then I um, measure their AP psychology test score at the end. And let's say here it's 4.5 on average and here it's 2.5. And I conclude, aha, teaching method A is better. Uh, this would have low internal validity. There's a big problem with the way I did this, um, which is someone not 104. Someone tell me what the, the problem is. So I want to conclude teaching method A is more effective. It leads to kids getting better scores. What's another possible explanation of this? Yes, exactly. Or it could be yeah, it could be they're smarter. The example I used in 104 was Vancouver kids are more depressed because they never see the sun. So you know, there's, there's different possibilities. Um, but the point is that you don't know if the kids in Edmonton and Vancouver are different. That would be an example of something called a confounding variable, sometimes called the confound for short, which is the biggest threat to internal validity. A confounding variable is anything that's different between the two conditions other than the independent variable. You want it to be the case that the only difference between the two groups is the thing that you manipulated, the independent variable. If there's something else that's different, in this case, uh, what city they're from, uh, well, now you don't know. You don't know if it's where they're from that's making them do better, or if it's the teaching method, A versus B. This is again why random assignment is so important. So that's internal validity. External validity is about whether the results in your study will generalize to the real world outside of your study. So you have your, your sample and you, you found whatever thing you found in there, um, but no one cares about your sample. The hundred people you got into the lab to do a survey or, or God knows what. Um, no one cares about those people. What we care about is the population. We care about whether the effect will hold in the real world. And external validity is about that. There are two main threats to external validity that you should know. One, we've already talked about, is an unrepresentative sample. Right? If you got in only um, white males from the ages of 30 to 40, um, you may have high internal validity. You may do your experiment perfectly well, manipulate the independent variable, no confounding variables, uh, but if the result, uh, the, the result may not generalize to the population. It may only be true for those types of people. So an unrepresentative sample is a threat to external validity. <clears throat> Another threat is some kind of unrealistic lab situation. And I'll pick on my own research here. Uh, so I uh, do work in moral psychology. I study how people respond to moral dilemmas. Uh, my supervisor and I even once did a brain scan study where we did you know, EEG while people were responding to moral dilemmas. Um, but there's a question of external validity there, right? Because what people are really doing is they're sitting in a lab, reading dilemmas on a computer screen and clicking yes or no. Um, how they respond in a lab may be different from how they would, would respond to a real moral dilemma in the real world. Um, so that would be a potential threat to the external validity uh, of the studies. Any questions about uh, the two types of validity? The, the two types of validity of uh, an experimental design? Yes? External validity? Yes. Uh, external validity is 
will the results generalize beyond your study? So let's say you do, let's say you, let's, let's take mine. So uh, you find some pattern in how people respond to moral dilemmas. Okay, will people respond that way in the real world outside of your little lab situation? Or take a, a drug trial. I have a drug, but, uh, and I do a placebo-controlled trial, so one group gets the real drug, one group gets the placebo, and the people who get the real drug are happier at the end. They'll say it's an antidepressant. Um, okay, but uh, will the drug work in the real world, not just in your experiment? So if you only, I'll use the unrepresentative sample example, if I only have uh, Asian women from the ages of 60 to 70 in my study, and the drug works, well maybe it only works for Asian women between the ages of 60 and 70. I don't know if the drug will work for everyone. So that would be, a, that would be another way in which you can have low external validity. Any other questions? Okay, so I just mentioned placebo, uh, and Hank Green did as well, so uh, something I'm sure many of you know about is the placebo effect, and uh, before I introduce it, I'm gonna show a, a, a video that will help me, help me introduce uh, the concept. Okay, we'll stop there. So why did I show you that? So, uh, this is, he, he is exactly correct, that is the underlying assumptions of homeopathic medicine, and yet, many people swear by it and say that they were cured by homeopathic pills. Um, probably the reason is the placebo effect. Taking a medication and believing that it will help actually does help. Um, leaving aside homeopathy, in the case of depression, we know that in, I think it's a six month window, if you take a sample of depressed people, around a third uh, will get better with nothing. Around half will get better if you give them a placebo. So measurably more uh, than the people who get nothing. Only about 60 to 70% get better with the real antidepressant. So actually not that much better than placebo, funny enough. Uh, yes? Will an effective medicine be like disturbed if you like believe that it won't work? Like, will it yes, that's called the nocebo effect. Uh, or, the, actually, nocebo, I think, is when you believe there will be side effects and it gives you side effects. So are, are you asking, will the placebo effect be decreased if you well, believe in it less? If you take an effective pill and believe that it doesn't work, or if you're convinced by some delusion that it's a placebo or something, will it oh, interesting. decrease its effectiveness? I would suspect so, but I have no idea. That's, it's an empirical question. Someone would have to, maybe one of you can do an honor's thesis on that or something. But yes, anyway, so this is why we do placebo-controlled trials, right? You have to control for uh, the placebo effect. Uh, but there's another uh, problem that we have to control for, and that's experimenter expectancy effects. Experimenter expectancy effects are where the researcher's expectations or beliefs influence uh, how the experiment turns out. So let's say these two people up front, uh, they're both in my study, and I give you the, uh, the placebo and I give you the antidepressant. And I know who got which. And you come in to get your pill. And I go, ah, there you go. Uh, you know, I may give off subtle vibes, uh, that I'm not so confident that you're going to get better. Maybe not intentionally, but you know, I believe this drug is going to work and it shows in my face and how I treat it. Where you can go, oh, hope you're doing better, here's your medicine, right? And that may actually lead to uh, an effect, which is a problem. We don't want it to be the case that that's why the drug works. We want to know that the drug actually works. So to control for this, and uh, Hank Green mentioned this, we do a double blind procedure. Uh, single blind means the subjects don't know who's in which conditions, like they don't know if they're getting a placebo or not. Double blind means neither the researcher nor the subjects know who's in which condition. Uh, 
So I actually have another video already. Uh, this one is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a physicist, uh, explaining why double-blind experiments and uh, replication is very important. Replication we'll be talking about uh, next. This is a nice bridge into uh, replication. Okay, so that's a nice uh, lead-in to the next topic, which is replication. So, uh, replication is a very important uh, thing to strive for in science. A replication is where, uh, as he said, someone else does your experiment again. You may have found a particular result, uh, but who knows, maybe you're bad at statistics, maybe you're biased, maybe you had kind of a, just a random sample that had some weird people in it who kind of messed the data up, uh, whatever. There's all sorts of things that can happen. Um, we don't have a lot of confidence in it until it's been replicated a few times. Very important for science. Unfortunately, uh, how many of you have heard of the replication crisis? I hope at least my 104 people have. Um, so the replication crisis is something that started in psychology but it's extended to other areas of science, including medicine, um, is where we discovered that many findings in psychology uh, don't replicate very well. There was some work in the early 2010s where they would take a bunch of random studies from random journals in psychology, including some very high, uh, highly prestigious ones, and just do the study again. And it depends what you count as a successful replication, but optimistically, around half replicate. By some estimates, more like a third. I forget the exact numbers, it depends on which criteria you use, but a lot of them did not replicate. And uh, one, there, there's many reasons for this, but one culprit is the way that psychologists use uh, the p-value and uh, statistical significance. This will probably be the last thing that we talk about. So the p-value, which is not in the book, but it's very important for understanding how replication works. The p-value is the probability of getting your result if there's no effect in the population. So in the case of a drug, it would be, so let's say I, you know, I have two conditions, uh, you know, the drug and uh, the placebo, and let's say it's uh, you know, an antidepressant, and I'm measuring their happiness, and the, the drug people are 9.5 out of, out of 10 happy, and the placebo people are 4 out of 10 happy, in that case, uh, the p-value would be, what's the probability of getting that result if the drug doesn't work? Because you may have just happened to sample more happy people, or assign more happy people into the drug condition. Could be. Um, in this case, the p-value would be very low, right? It'd be like 0 0.001 or something. You'd have to know other information to get an exact number, but um, it's very unlikely that you would get a result, a difference that big, if the drug doesn't work. So you want a small p-value. They range from zero to one. Um, so in the social sciences and in biology, the standard cutoff we set is 0 0.05. Sometimes just set, uh, they say just 0.05. But, uh, so what we've decided as a field, and this may be changing now, but is we want a result to have a p-value of less than 0.05 before we consider it statistically significant. That's kind of a cutoff that we set, and uh, as I say, we want the p-value to be less than that. And the reason this connects with replication is a lot of scientists before the replication crisis, including in psychology, um, what they would do is they would get it, do an experiment, collect a bunch of variables, and they would just measure lots of things, just kind of play with the data, maybe try this correlation, you know, this analysis, and they would keep doing that until they got something with a p-value of less than 0.05. But if you do that, um, 
you're inflating the chance that you get a false positive. Uh, you're, infl you're inflating the chance that you kind of just found something by chance that won't replicate. So I see that we are almost out of time. Uh, we'll start here next time and just finish this off. I don't know if I'm still going to this. Uh, so I will see you all uh, next week.